What do you say to a pastor who says apologetics is just philosophy and we do not need that? All we need is the Bible. Now, I've heard people say that. Obviously, you've never heard me say that. Um, I have never said uh, that apologetics is just philosophy. Obviously, I do not say that we do not need apologetics. Um, so it's it, it's an imbalanced question from my perspective. Um, Ravi's response was, I desperately wish it were that simple. When pastors believe and teach all we need is the Bible, they equip their young people with the very line that gets them mocked in the universities and makes them unable and even terrified to relate to their friends. If pastors want their young people to do the work of evangelism to reach their friends, that line will not get them anywhere. Even the Bible that Christ gave us is sustained by the miracle of the resurrection. That, I think, is where he's trying to go. Even the Bible that Christ gave us is sustained by the miracle of the resurrection. The resurrection gave the early church the argument that Christ is risen. We saw, we witnessed, we felt, and we touched. The Apostle Paul defended this gospel. He went to Athens and planted a church there. In Ephesus, he defended the faith in the school of Tyrannus. We also need to become all things to all people. If a pastor says, all we need is the Bible, uh, what does he say to a man who says, all I need is the Quran? It is a solipsistic method of arguing. Now, we know that Ravi's not a presuppositionalist. The pastor is saying, all I need is my own point of reference and nothing more than that. Even the gospel has verified was verified by external references. The Bible is a book of history, a book of geography, not just a book of spiritual assertions. The fact is the resurrection from the dead was the ultimate proof that in history and an empirically verifiable means, the word of God was made certain. Otherwise, the experience in the Mount of Transfiguration would have been good enough. But the Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 1.19, we have the word of the prophets made more certain as to a light shining in a dark place. He testified to the authority and person of Christ and the resurrected person of Christ. To believe all we need is the Bible and nothing more is what the monks believed in medieval times and they resorted to monasteries. Now, I just got to stop right there and go, no, that's not what they believed. That's not, that's, that's not an accurate reflection of monastic foundational theological belief. I'm sorry, it's just, it's just not. We all know the end of that story. This argument may be good enough for those who are convinced the Bible is authority. The Bible, however, is not authoritative in culture or in a world of counter perspectives. To say that it is authoritative in the, these situations is to deny both how the Bible defends itself and how our young people need to defend the Bible's sufficiency. Now, this is a fundamentally different perspective than what I present. There's no question about it. This is not presuppositionalism. This is evidentialism. I do not believe it's apostolic. Um, but I also don't think it's what Andy Stanley was saying, or I'm not sure what the connection is. Um, it is sad that some people think a person who asks why the Bible is being dishonest, this is a legitimate question. Okay, now, a couple things. Uh, when, when Ravi says even the gospel is verified by, ex by external references, what does he mean by that? Does he mean that the gospel happened in history and therefore it's historically true? Or does he mean that the authority of the gospel is dependent upon uninspired sources? This is, this again, is the issue of epistemology. And, and so much of apologetics really is a discussion of how we know what we know. And as creatures made in the image of God, how do we know what we know? What is, does the Bible even address this? Some people would say it doesn't. I, I think it most definitely does, not in a simplistic, well, here is a biblical epistemology type thing. But I think it very clearly addresses the primacy of revelation over against all of human philosophy. 
And I think when you take together Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 especially, you put those two together, you do have a very strong foundation for developing a meaningful Christian epistemology. Together with the fact that Peter's point in 2 Peter, um, it says he testified to the authority and person of Christ, the resurrected person of Christ. But while Peter did that, he said that that was subsidiary to the prophetic witness. And that's then what gives rise to Peter's description of the very nature of Scripture. And that is that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And it was that prophetic witness to the person of Christ, the ministry of Christ, and then the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that is more certain than Peter's own experience. That was the point there at that particular text of Scripture. And so, the question, is, when, when he says the Bible, however, is not authoritative in culture or in a world of counter-perspectives, yes, it is. Um, culture and counter-perspectives, from a Christian perspective, are lower authorities than God speaking. This goes to what the, the point of contact is. The point of contact is not some type of, of neutral ground upon which we reason and argue. The apostles never presented any theory of neutrality. Even when Paul stood in front of those who did not accept the Jewish scriptures as authoritative, that did not stop him from making the proclamation that a day was coming when all of mankind would be judged by one man, Jesus Christ, who was perfectly fitted for that role because of the fact that he was raised from the dead. And, and Paul knew as soon as he said resurrection, they were going to scoff, they were going to mock. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. Um, so, I just, I, I cannot possibly agree with the statement, the Bible, however, is not authoritative in culture or any world of counter-perspectives. To say that it's authoritative in these situations is to deny both how the Bible defends itself and how our young people need to defend the Bible's sufficiency. Well, if you think the only way to do that is through an evidentialist methodology, uh, well then, okay, but obviously there are a whole bunch of us out here that go, that's not how the Bible defends itself. And that's not how our young people will be able to defend the Bible's sufficiency. Because if the Bible's fundamental authority is derivative from secondary means, from other means, it's derivative from these historical sources and these manuscript sources and these things over there, its authority can never supersede any of those. And yet that is what is needed to fundamentally establish the reality of the resurrection in the first place. This has always been my criticism, is that the evidentialist wants to pretend that we can treat... Well, you, you've how many times have we re reviewed uh, uh, debates where someone will say, now, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to believe that the, that the gospel accounts are inspired or authored. Just take them as generally reliable historical sources. And... The atheist is absolutely positively right when his response is generally reliable historical sources are insufficient to establish what you call the resurrection. And they're right. Generally historical, reliable historical sources can tell us things that happened in the past, but what we're talking about is something absolutely stupendous. And it requires a source that has sufficient authority to establish these things. And now, is that what Andy Stanley's saying? I, I, I honestly, 
the, the few times that I've ever seen any of his teaching, you know, and, and now in the big mega churches, it's the open collar, no pulpit, sitting on the bar stool, uh, you know, fancy background type thing. It's been very fuzzy. Um, it, it's never been on this level of what Ravi Zacharias is saying. So if, if that's what he's trying to say, well, I would still disagree because I'm disagreeing with Ravi on this. There is a fundamental difference. This is not something new. We've, I mean, we've been talking about this for decades. It's not something new. You know, I, I, if someone goes around, James White was attacking Ravi Zacharias today on the dividing line. That's all he ever does. You know, I can just, I, I'll just see it. I, you know, I, I predict its, its appearance. But the reality is we've talked about this thing so many times. We've talked about the, the foundations of apologetics. And we've talked about the vast difference um, between having a sure word from the Lord, being dependent upon the Spirit, recognizing that the message that is preached is foolishness to the world. And if you ever develop an apologetic methodology where it's no longer foolishness to the world, it's no longer the gospel. 